Now we're going to have a panel um, on collaborative online international learning. We've heard a little bit about this. Um, Professor DeWitt mentioned it earlier. Um, and then we're gonna tackle the discussion about virtual study abroad. Um, so we're going to kick it off with a presentation um, from Professor uh, Kiko Ikeda, in, who is a professor of international affairs at Kensai University in Japan. Uh, and following that, um, so Keiko her um, what her institution has been doing. And then following that, we're going to have a discussion with um, a presentation from Jamie Andrew, who is the uh, head of program development at Academic Experiences Abroad, and as well as Eric Lisi, who is the director of international relations at Black Hills State University. So we're going to kick it off with this video um, from Professor Ikeda, and then I will uh, invite Jamie and Eric to join the discussion. So off, take it away, Keiko. Hi, I'm Keiko Ikeda from Kansai University, Osaka, Japan. I am a vice director for my institution called IIGE, Institute for Innovative Global Education. Much appreciation for this chance to share with you about uh, virtual exchange and COIL collaborative online international learning today. Virtual exchange and COIL are ways to create opportunities for international communication and collaboration with the pre-existing curriculum on campus using the digital tools available today. Let me provide you with a brief overview here. What is virtual exchange? A virtual exchange has an arc of engagement with the beginning, middle, and the end that is built and centered on the participants and the project goals. Virtual exchange should use a mix of synchronous, that means live, for example, a tools like Zoom, Google Meet, and asynchronous, that means time delay, for example, make use of recorded videos, social media posts, or emails. Those technologies that allow participants to interact and exchange beyond the surface level of connections. Virtual exchange refers to a different approach to online intercultural exchange projects in education today. Within virtual exchange family, there is a particular style of a virtual exchange called COIL, Collaborative Online International Learning. COIL is a team teaching effort by domestic and overseas courses offered in different institutions. It provides a project-based learning to the students in an international team setting. Because of the design of the practice, COIL enables teachers to bring collaborative learning to students. It also engages students more to the classroom learning from various cross-cultural encounters and communication. That students would go through it uh, this brings a high impact learning effect as learning outcome. Let me share with you some examples of COIL with visual images. Kansai University, where I belong, we have done two US-Japan COIL collaborations, for example, in the fall 2019. One is between James Madison University and Kansai University. At the JMU side, the course is called Making Sense of Beliefs and Values, a guided tour for global citizens. And at the Kansai University end, the course was called Field-Based Learning. There were five groups, each had a different theme, such as conflict resolution, human rights, global education, and sustainability. Their goal was to identify a wicked problem in their community, and within each group, they generated a slideshow or movie or presentation, whichever the media they prefer, that identified the problem and discussed opinions about it. The collaboration was four weeks, fairly short due to the gap of the academic calendar of both sides, but yet students had a lot to say about the interaction they had. For both Japan and US side, there was an important cross-cultural impact on the students and their learning process has been influenced because of this experience. 
Virginia and Japan have a good 13 to 14 hour time difference. It is difficult to carry out live communication for the entire four weeks. How we solved it was to do one time live connection using Zoom as a web conferencing tool to get students virtually meet for their first time and then have them discuss with each other in the breakout sessions such as an as an icebreaker group meeting. After that, students in each group communicated with each other on their own pace and meet the task goal, which is to produce a joint research project. COIL model of virtual exchange would usually go through steps to get them involved in a joint project. Various ice breaking and further exercises such as video streaming share, opinion exchanges, etc. are done before they are guided into a collaborative project task. Task design for these activities are decided by the two instructors from both sides, coordinating with their original learning objectives for the course, and then generating a joint task design for COIL. Directions for international team project such as COIL must be clearly delivered and participants must be respectful for cultural and institutional differences from both sides. Because of this nature, this particular pedagogy brings many positive learning effects both on teachers and the students. Let me now spend a few minutes to discuss the relevancy of COIL or virtual exchange for the audience of this conference. Recent survey done by QS may give us a hint. The pandemic crisis that world is going through at the moment has produced a group who has given up on their study abroad opportunities and the group who has postponed for a year for their chance. In the meantime, then students are back from their study abroad destinations, more or less stuck at their home ground. This is a universal context, certainly for US and Japan. The crisis has also created another still increasing group in the world, those who are interested in online education by overseas institutions. They stay put at their home ground, but they seek virtual mobility beyond their country. My point here is that international education now more than ever, virtual channels of education are now on demand. As one of the very possible options, COIL or virtual exchange may come into the picture. When we integrate virtual options into international education, now we can go into various directions as to how to design one's international educational program. From a predominantly physical mobility course or predominantly virtual experience, we can create combination of the two practices to get more impact this being called blended mobility. Blended mobility is a deliberate combination of both physical and online mobility based on educational design. In this case, the advantage of short or long immersion are combined with an advantage of a flexible implementation of mobility, capturing both the benefits of physical and the virtual mobility. There are many merits to consider blended mobility. For the virtual exchange part of the program, the larger the number of students, you would expect a lower cost per head. So it would be easy on the students affordability to join an international program. With the high rise of students interested in online education in the world now, it is most likely that blended online education enables universities to multiply international student numbers while keeping quality under control. Traditional study abroad usually involves only two universities, the home ground and target overseas destination. When virtual exchange is brought into the picture, the program can be organized among more than two universities in the multi-campus scheme. It can be flexibly organized by finding the right balance between synchronous or asynchronous modes of teaching and learning. Study abroad almost always involves air travel, arguably the most fuel intensive way to move around. For example, a round trip from New York to London about 7,000 miles 
produces something on an order of three tons of CO2 per passenger. Yet, as an international educator, I would still argue that the value of a culture imagined experience is, however, very, very valuable. Study abroad experience would definitely bring the immersive impact. When a student studies at a location where, say, people live less carbon intensive uh, lifestyles or smart city design with the SDGs bound mindset, such an Im immersed experience would most likely inspire him or her in a her lifestyle changes upon return. For that kind of impact, student mobility is definitely indispensable. How to find a resolution for international educators with the concerns for the environment would bring me to think that a blended mobility is a way to go. If a physical mobility is definitely worthwhile, particularly for the long-term study abroad with the a year to a few years, study abroad is still a strong option. For very short-term programs, and we tend to have more and more nowadays, we can perhaps rethink whether it brings the desired impact by just having the physical mobility or switch to blended mode. Ultimate goals of international education, to me at least, is to bring the students international high impact learning and provide them with a transformative learning in, in their experience. Virtual exchange or COIA contributes to this goal, possibly it leads us to see the new normal of international education through this time of crisis. Okay, so that's it for now. That's just a snippet of virtual exchange and COIA world from me. I'll be more than happy to receive your feedback and question through email, keiko ikeda at kandaicourse.net. IIGE and Kansai University will be very happy to assist your first steps to get started. Thank you very much for watching and take care and please stay well, everybody. Great, that's wonderful. So at this time, I just want to um, invite our next speakers to turn on the camera and there they are. Okay, so I'm Janie Andrew and I am the head of program development at AEA and I'm presenting with Eric. <laughs> Eric, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Yeah. I'm Eric Leisley, Director of International Relations at Black Hill State University, which is out in Western South Dakota in a town of about 10,000 people. So a little bit of initial context for what we'll talk about next. Totally. So we're excited to talk more about virtual study abroad and expand on some of the things that were in Keiko's presentation, um, specifically thinking about how we can really increase access um, while reducing emissions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about AEA first and what we're doing, and then I'll turn it over to Eric and he can talk about what they're doing at BHSU. So AEA specializes in customized faculty-led programs. Um, we actually have teams in 95 countries. Um, as you can imagine, our last program ran this year, the very first week of March, and like, you know, pretty much everybody, we're really not sure when we're going to run our next program. We hope it'll be sooner rather than later, but it's a big question mark. So we spent a lot of time working on virtual experiences and programs. And the more we've worked on these, the more excited we've gotten about not just the short term implications of what we can do in a COVID world, but even in the long term, once COVID is subsided and things get back to a new normal. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about those in detail on the next slide, but they include things like virtual speakers, meetings, exchanges, and internships as well. Um, a very important thing that I'd like to mention is that we are all about our university partnerships and um, everything that we do is customized. So we don't have set programs that students sign up for. Everything we do, we work directly with um, university administrators and faculty to, to build together so that it really fits um, the university or college of students and programs and schools and all of that. And that's really um, pervasive in everything that we do. Um, so you can see a handful of uh, lovely uh, humans from lots of different corners of the world. The main thing we've been working on in the last few months are virtual speakers. And there's a few reasons for this. Um, this model, I think, is very exciting um, because it is very easy to integrate into pre-existing courses. Um, we had a course that was supposed to go to Amsterdam in March, um, and it was a fantastic 
program, wonderful itinerary, and a ton of really specialized uh, speakers and experts and practitioners. Um, and it was such a disappointment to see all of those, you know, hours and hours spent or making all those arrangements and the faculty's curriculum just kind of feel like they were disappearing. So we actually were able to set up several virtual meetings via Zoom with the same individuals, with the, with the students, with the teacher. They talked about the same things they would talk about in person. Obviously, it would have been wonderful if the students had been there, but um, it was pretty amazing how easy it was to connect and for them to learn about what these people were doing and to have conversations about it. So um, we've since reached out to our network and we have a huge network because we work with people in 95 different countries. So we have this gigantic network of people and access to them. Um, we've had several requests for different types of programs. One example is a business administration program this summer. Um, they're doing a comparative study of um, different business models and um, ways of doing business in different countries. And so we collected a handful of different practitioners, business business people to talk and, and they've selected three from the ones that we put together. And now the students will have a chance to sit and directly talk with um, these people in these different countries about what they do and how they do it. So that's been very exciting. I think this is something that, you know, is very cost effective. I mean, if you have a, a group of students in a, in a class that can come out to like $20 a student, something like that. Um, so it's something that I think the, the reach can really extend um, far, far beyond um, the students that go abroad historically every year. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. So uh, the next thing we've talked about doing are organizational exchanges. And I think Keiko is really talking about this model and her presentation a lot with the uh, two universities working together. Um, that's something that, uh, you know, we could also help do. Uh, we have lots of connections to different um, NGOs and even villages, communities, um, in addition to universities and colleges. Um, for people who are looking to do like a longer term project um, with maybe a little bit of a deeper um, immersion. That's something that I think there's a lot of potential for really meaningful, um, you know, thought and collaboration um, with our students here um, and overseas. And then we've also talked about recorded excursions, which could be either video or audio, sort of podcast style. And these would provide access to places that don't have streaming internet um, readily available. So maybe a rural farm or, you know, a cooperative or things like that um, to provide access and insight into these things. Um, all of these things continue to support the local communities, um, which is also very important to us, um, especially at this time when, as you all know, just global tourism in general is very, very low. And all of these things um, require, of course, far less carbon than getting on a plane and, and going somewhere. So that's the overview of, you know, sort of the things that we've been putting together. I love Eric to talk a little bit about what they're doing at BHSU and how this relates. So I hand it over to you, Eric. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Um, so at Black Hill State University, we are a small regional public university, part of the system of um, South Dakota. So we have about 4,000 mostly regional students. Um, I say that because we face challenges historically in increasing mobility of students, both our students going abroad, but also international students coming to us. And so, in my role as Director of International Relations, I have been carrying conversations forward with our administration, even before the coronavirus pandemic um, became a thing in March. Um, these conversations started for us um, about six months prior to really be thinking of how can we be doing what we call study abroad a bit differently keeping in mind the need to expand access and equity um, for all of our students. And so historically, Black Hill State has had the typical complement of programs. So exchange programs over a semester, a full year or summer, third party provider programs, um, which we all know well, working with AEA to develop and deliver faculty led programs on a short term basis. Um, 
So more of the, the standard um, traditional set of experiences that we're used to. Um, where we are now, um, particularly with COVID, I, I feel like this is both a blessing and a curse. Um, I think that it has raised fundamental questions for the higher ed institution about basically the whole enterprise of international education. And I think it intersects directly with climate change and issues around climate and also changing student behaviors and preferences. So um, we have been carrying conversations again about how we can think about this differently and just to throw some examples out. Um, the domestic service learning model has become something of great interest to Black Hills State. We have always done service learning, but it had taken a bit of a backseat to more of the faculty led program short term program model and reviving that service learning more domestic based but yet still cross cultural intercultural type experience where students are being exposed to global social problems in our own backyard and then bringing that back to campus in a more applied manner has been a conversation that we've been having um, and I will just say for good of the order, Jamie, that Jamie and I have been having that conversation as well. <laughs> this is where our collaboration comes into play. Um, so that, that's one potential model that we're exploring to address um, all of these complex issues that are brought forth through climate change, global pandemics. And then again, more on a higher level, I think the, the access issue around how much it costs and also changing student behaviors with Gen Z students. Um, that's one model. A second model, and this may actually address a question that's been posed in the Q&As &E, Q by um, Amara, or Amira, sorry if I didn't pronounce that right, is intersecting this with international student recruitment um, and enrollment as well as services. So we have an exchange partner in a European country who is a very deep and long lasting partner for BH. Um, we spend a fair amount of time together. Um, we, have, we have by chance similar international enrollment and recruitment goals. And so we have been carrying conversations about essentially offering a partial curriculum from BH to their international students at their university and combining that with um, potentially short-term trips abroad, maybe three weeks over summer in either direction um, to give students that on-campus experience as part of their degree program, but not as a full degree program, if that makes sense. So really delivering a hybrid model where students are earning credit towards a dual degree or a joint degree, and then having an option to supplement that with time at either university. So our students going there or their students coming to us. Um, so in that way, we're trying to think of ways that we can overlap our existing exchange partnerships with our international enrollment goals, as well as our study abroad or outgoing mobility goals. Um, again, that's another model that we're discussing and looking at and trying to figure out how feasible and viable that would be. Um, those would be the two main conversations that we've been having, but of course, much of this is couched against um, a very clear sense for us, given again our population and where we're located, that we need to make access more equitable for all students, and as well as keeping things like climate impact top of mind as we rethink how we can still get the same kind of pedagogical and developmental outcomes for students, but doing it in a bit of a different way. Um, I will also just end this point by saying that another reason that this has come up at Black Hill State is that we have a major sustainability effort at our institution to be carbon neutral by 2050 and we're over 60% of the way there. All of our major buildings are um, powered through solar power. We have a windmill on campus. Um, so there's, there, there's a lot of other sustainability things that are part of our identity and fitting international education into that sustainable identity is where this conversation, I think, really dovetails, like I said, with all of those other cross-cutting issues. Um, so while we don't have any concrete outcomes to speak of at this point, I guess it remains to be determined. And uh, we, again, will continue 
working with Jamie and our folks and our friends at AEA to, to try and advance some of these new models and figure out really how to have the biggest impact while providing the most access. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Jamie and Eric. Uh, we, we're really grateful for your time and, and your expertise and very inspiring work that you're doing.